Video game hardware all started with a simple question. Can a computer beat a human? Nowadays, this is of course true. AIs have been developed that beat the masters of chess at their favorite game. Back in the day, this was not the case though. Computers had no way near the processing power to get anywhere close to a human's capability. And this conflict between man and machine is still the core principle of video games today. Today's question therefore is, how do we get from nothing but the dirt on the ground to the powerful game devices like this one that we know and love today? And to answer that question, I'm off to Munich to the German Museum of Technology. See you there. Oh yeah, and don't forget to subscribe and press the notification bell if you haven't done so already. See you in a bit. Before we make our way to Munich, let's discuss the very origin of computer games. It's probably not too hard to believe, but it lies in board games. More specifically in the game called NIM. It is a simple game, played with just a few heaps of items. The most common rule set is using a heap of 7, 5, 3 and 1 item each. Both players take turns drawing items from the heap. Each player is able to take as many items from a single heap in his turn as he wants, while having to take at least one. The goal is to ensure that the opponent player has to draw the last item from the last heap, as the last one to draw will lose the game. So, what makes this game so special for the history of computer games? The answer is that the simplicity of the game allowed for a very straightforward winning strategy. What makes a strategy so special is that it is really, really easy to write a computer program that plays it. This was a necessary key to beating a human at a game. This spurred the invention of the Nimatron, which was presented at the New York World's Fair in 1940. The machine is purely electromechanical, meaning it was basically operated by cogs and cylinders. This still allowed computing the logic and winning strategy of NIM. The Nimatron was also successful at its task of beating a human. It played around 100,000 matches and won around 90,000. Roughly speaking, a win rate of 90%. Can you define the Nimatron as a computer game though? I'm unsure, but its next iteration, the Nimrod, definitely can. The Nimrod was developed for the festival in Britain in 1951. The Nimrod was a massive machine taking up the whole room. The hardware for the computation of the game's logic, however, only took around 2% of its size. The rest was exclusively used for light tubes that combined together displayed the size of the heaps. In effect, the first computer game display was formed. Interestingly enough, the visitors of the festival in Britain were really awed by the Nimatron. But the science behind it was irrelevant to them. They were simply amazed by the blinking and flashing lights. Kind of similar to the video games of today, isn't it? So, the content that you see in this video was actually part of a computer science course that I did last semester. And as part of the course, I had to write a thesis that I would have to then present in Munich in the German Museum in front of the whole class and in front of the actual devices that I wrote about. So, since I'm traveling in a group, I have to get everyone's permission to film them. And that's what I'm gonna do now. Just a quick heads up. Bad audio quality incoming. Before filming anyone, you need permission. Um, do you, is it okay for you to film or do you want black bars maybe? Or maybe should I put a pixelated face? Black bars, please. Black bars? Yes. All right, done. Happy? Yes, thank you. Now that I have everyone's permission, it is time to look at the very next step of video game hardware, a game by the name of Tennis for Two. Tennis for Two was developed by the physicist William Higginbotham in 1958. At that point in time, analog computers existed. Calculations were computed by measuring the intensity of a current. The devices were programmed by creating connections with pluggable wires between different parts of the analog computer. These machines were, interestingly enough, already able to determine projectile trajectories with air resistance, for example, those of tennis balls. This gave the idea of creating a player-controlled input for the analog computer, making this computer game possible. Notice how I said computer game and not video game here. This has a very distinct reason. Nowadays, the terms video game and computer game are virtually synonymous. This was not the case back in the day, however. One small detail makes a difference here. The term video game requires the game to be played on a raster scan display. In other words, it requires all pixels on the display to be refreshed once on each new frame. In today's world, basically all consumer displays are based on a raster scan method, causing the synonymousness of the two terms. 
Back in the day, near the origins of video games, roster scan displays weren't as widely available. The limited processing power of computers at that time was also unable to drive a display that updated each pixel every frame. Other ways to display information had to be used, and here comes the oscilloscope, the display of Tennis for Two. An oscilloscope works by having a line go from left to right every single set time interval. In effect, this creates a single line per frame. This line can be manipulated very easily, however, by varying the potential difference on the y-axis. You are thus able to display information on the oscilloscope with a fast refresh rate. Since the variation of the potential difference is easily programmable, the oscilloscope became the necessary key for displaying tennis for two. Oscilloscopes are still used very widely in science, especially in physics today. Right now we are on our way to Munich where we'll be holding our presentations for our coursework. And now there is a choice. What I do in the bus. Do I play my Nintendo Switch? Or do I go through the work for my presentation to prepare it? The choice was quite simple here. I mean, it was 5 o'clock in the morning and I was really tired. The next evolutionary step is Space Wars, which was developed in 1961 by Steve Russell at MIT. It was at the time the digital step, as the game ran on the PDP-1 digital computer. Like Tennis for Two, it was a very simple game. It had two spaceships and the victory condition was to shoot down the opposing ship. This game was once again not a video game, as the display was not based on raster scan technology. The display had a resolution of 1024 x 1024 pixels. Instead of refreshing the entire frame, the display was capable of addressing 20,000 individual pixels per second and then subsequently displaying them. Comparing this to a 60Hz monitor of today at the same resolution, only 2% of the pixels could be displayed. This was however enough to show text or even a simple game such as Space Wars. Interestingly enough, the stars shown in the game were originally a visual bug. Just like what Todd Howard claims about the bugs in Skyrim, the stars added to the experience and were thus kept in the game. The computer on which the game ran, the PDP-1, was called a mini-computer by the way. What? A computer that filled an entire room was called mini? Hard to believe, right? But everything is always stated in relation. Computers during the time took up the space of entire warehouses. A room compared to a warehouse? That's mini. And the name of the computer was justified. Anyhow, the PDP-1 ran at a frequency of 187 kHz and was able to do nearly 100,000 calculations per second. In contrast, your mobile phone can already run at gigahertz frequencies. Those tiny devices are 10,000 times faster than room computers. Thus, Space War became quite popular at universities. Well, basically the only places where computers of that size could be bought and even stored. The size and financial limitations prevented this game from any further appeal in the mass market. So we finally arrived in Munich and now we're waiting for the S-Bahn to arrive. There is a group over there, but I don't, they don't like being showed. And yeah, waiting for the S-Bahn. To the museum, let's do this. The view is amazing. Computers were for a long time way too big and expensive to be available to a typical consumer. This started to change in the year 1951, however. An employee at the TV manufacturing firm, Laurel, by the name of Ralph Baer, experimented with ideas to set his company's TVs apart from the competition. One of his ideas was to put a video game into the televisions. This idea was unfortunately shot down by Ralph Baer's superintendent. Ralph Baer didn't give up on this idea, but it wasn't until 15 years later in the summer of 1966, where he got another shot at this concept. While waiting at a bus stop for a fellow engineer, he made good use of his time and designed a concept in which a dot and a few bars were movable by player input on a typical television set. His concept got greenlit and development started shortly after. Thus, in February of 1967, the concept was realized. A single dot was movable on a TV. The first video game, where it all started, was born. From that point on, multiple years of development commenced. In addition to a dot, bars were also made possible to be displayed. Peripherals such as the light gun, which was used later in 1984 in Nintendo's Duck Hunt, was also created. The sole issue during the late 1960s was, a few bars and dots were not visually appealing to consumers. Some ideas came about such as cooperating 
working with a cable network to display a live transmission of a tennis court. The dots and bars would then be overlaid on that tennis court, creating a more visually appealing game. Unfortunately, these kind of corporations never came into fruition, and Ralph Baer's project was once again at risk of failing. Ralph Baer was not a quitter, however, and there is a reason his title of being the Thomas Edison of video games is justified. In 1972, six years after his initial concept, he was finally able to release the first ever video game console, the Magnavox Odyssey. This console was still only able to display a couple of bars and dots on the TV, and to make the games visually appealing, plastic overlays were stuck to the TV. These plastic overlays allowed the light to shine through and were exchanged for every single game. In 1972, it was actually already possible to display color dots and backgrounds. However, the necessary hardware for that was not included in the Magnavox Odyssey. For one reason. And can you guess it? Well, it's simple. It's cost. No one wants to have to get a second job just to be able to afford a PlayStation 3. Uh, I mean the Magnavox Odyssey, of course. So games were now playable on a television set on a consumer-grade console. The Magnavox Odyssey ended up inspiring other games, most famously Pong. Pong was developed by Nolan Bushnell and his partner Ted Dabney. They formed Atari, a company that at this time has unfortunately completely fallen from grace. Nolan's goal was to develop a game that could be played immediately without needing to read an instruction manual beforehand. This was the key differentiating point that made Pong a global cultural phenomenon. That reason makes the story of Pong basically synonymous to the history of video games. However, Pong is not that particularly interesting when it comes to the hardware of video games. So let's stay on topic and look at the next step in the evolution of video game hardware. At that point, I was getting quite worried about my presentation. After all, I didn't really prepare it beforehand and slept instead. Wish me luck on my presentation. I need it. <laughs> I definitely need it. The next step in the development of video game hardware was a very important one. The separation of hardware and software. With the Magnavox Odyssey and other consoles at that time, the cartridge used didn't contain the code on how a game runs. Instead, it had the actual physical logic circuits built in that were necessary to operate the games. This kind of design made it very difficult to create games for these consoles and these early consoles had maybe 10 to 20 games released on them if they were lucky. But this changed with the company Fairchild's release of the Fairchild Channel F the first console to contain a programmable CPU. This made game development much faster, expansive and simpler and this simplicity made it possible for Fairchild to develop a total of 27 games for the system. That's still not a lot, but much better than previous devices. In theory, it would have now been possible for third-party developers to create games for the system. Fairchild's console, however, did not receive that honor. This one goes to the Atari 2600, which released in 1977 and made quite a lot more sales than Fairchild's system. Like with modern video games, game consoles. The devices with the most sales also get the most third-party titles, and the sales numbers of the Atari 2600 made it worthwhile for other developers to create games. A group of developers working at Atari were quite unhappy working for the company due to poor working conditions. However, they enjoyed crafting games for the Atari 2600 and wanted to continue doing so. They broke off from Atari and formed their own company, Activision. Yes, that same exact company that you know and love for hit titles such as Call of Duty, Destiny and SpongeBob SquarePants, Plankton's Robotic Revenge. Of course, Atari didn't like that and filed a cease and desist against Activision, without success. This precedent legitimized third-party development, allowing Activision to become the very first third-party game development company in the world. Countless of other companies followed suit. With Atari having zero influence on the title's release for the device, anyone could make video games. Even programmers who had zero experience or interest in video game development were made by the companies they worked for to develop games. Quality control went down the toilet, leading us to one piece of history that you probably know already. The great video game crash of 1983. So, I'm now holding the presentation. Unfortunately, I am unable to show you its live presentation, as this presentation is basically an exam. However, you probably wouldn't understand anything anyways, as I was presenting in German. And before you ask, yes, I sounded very, very angry. The video game crash was thus a failure caused entirely by software. Hardware was sufficient enough for interesting games and had nothing to do with the collapse of the market. However, you might already know how the video game market was revitalized. It was due to Nintendo making the Nintendo Entertainment System, in short NES, along with releasing quality games. But it wasn't just the quality games that made the NES a success. The Atari 2600 also had quality games. They were simply buried under a barrage of poor games. Oh, hello Steam Store! 
Anyways, the problem with poor quality games wasn't solved by making more software, it was solved by hardware. Yes, a software problem was fixed with hardware. Nintendo built a small chip by the name of Checking Integrated Circuit, or in short, CIC, into the NES. The principle of this chip was simple. As long as no verified cartridge slotted into the NES, the NES would restart itself on every single CPU clock cycle. Thus, it acted as a lock that required a key to open. This key was only available to game makers if they went through the verification process with Nintendo successfully. And to be successful in this process, the game had to be decent enough, earning the Nintendo seal of approval. This also allowed Nintendo to charge money for licensing fees, netting them profit on every video game sold on the NES. These measures were enough. The value proposition was there for the consumers, who were happily buying up the console along with a collection of high quality games. Can you believe it? If it were not for that tiny CIC chip, we probably wouldn't have the video game market that we have today, and the Red Value YouTube channel would have absolutely nothing to talk about. So, now the presentation is finally over and I am exhausted. But now I've split from the group because I'm gonna soon meet up with my buddy to spend the weekend in Munich. Oh, it's gonna be great. I really look forward to this for a long time. It's gonna give me a break for once. But yeah, before I do that, I just wanna check out something really special about Munich, and that is the European Patent Office. The European Patent Office lies right next to the German Museum in Munich. As we saw in this video, technology keeps improving and it will do so in the future. There, it will be your turn to work and invent new things. And if you're successful with your projects, you'll be heading right here to the European Patent Office to sign up your inventions to be protected. Oh yeah, and make sure to subscribe to this channel as well on your way out. So yeah, be successful in life, get somewhere and you'll see yourself right here at the European Patent Office, filling out your patents, making sure they're protected from theft. And that was it. I hope you liked this video. And thanks for watching. Ah, I guess I hope to see you next time. And I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> Alright.